This is Julian Nickham. I'm back with uh, uh, Francis Mackey live on the phone. And I'd just like to remind people, if you're by the shortstop on Highland and Sterling, please say how mean it was that they sold us a dead phone card. Uh, so how are you doing, Mr. Mackey? Doing very well, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your organization. Yeah, I'm a national chairperson here in Ireland of the 32 County Sovereignty Movement. It's uh, an organisation that uh, was set up almost 20 years ago this year, uh, 1997, in the lead up to uh, the... Uh, Good Friday Agreement, there was negotiations with provisional Sinn Féin and the British government that led to the partition of our country being more entrenched than it had been and the uh, sovereignty of the Irish nation was uh, clear that it was going to be violated. So in that context, the uh, 32 county sovereignty movement was born out of like-minded Republicans uh, who stood against the, cha the uh, direction that republicanism was taken and that uh, to challenge the, the protagonists of that process in, in where they were taking uh, republicanism to normalizing British rule in Ireland. So we were formed in, in November of uh, 1997, and uh, uh, we set about uh, a strategy, developing a strategy to to uh, to advance our position, uh, and that brought us through 1998 with us lodging uh, a challenge to the British government at the United Nations, which is the only challenge uh, in existence against British rule in Ireland. That's a brief history of, of, of uh, how we were formed. Since its founding, what role did the 32 County Sovereignty Movement play in the present Republican politics? Well, I suppose the primary role of the 32 County Sovereignty Movement in current Republican politics is, is actually a, a dual role. Uh, one is upholding our right to national sovereignty in international law of the uh, our UN submission, which I've just alluded to, and also working in tandem with other Republican individuals and groups to build a Republican unity based on consensus. The United Nations submission, as I said, is the only legal challenge to British rule in Ireland, and it's the only one, it's the only challenge in existence. And its importance is twofold. Firstly, it bases the Republican struggle on uh, inalienable uh, national rights which cannot be subverted for uh, political expedience. And secondly, it's a legal challenge which can be adopted and supported without any political preconditions. And we view it as a contemporary hub around which uh, a unified Republican base can build a credible policy platform to advance uh, our uh, political objectives. And the 32 County Sovereignty Movement are currently working closely with other groups and individuals to put in place uh, a political strategy with a, a broad, as broad a consensus as possible. And there are many facets to this process, and each needs to be worked on carefully and patiently. Uh, steady progress has been made, but given the nature of it and the balances that are required, uh, details uh, of it are not being disclosed at this point in time. But hopefully in the near future that will be disclosed. Right on. Uh, sorry to jump in there, Francis. Uh, my name's Aaron. I'm also one of uh, Julian's, you know, helpers here. Uh, essentially, the question, one of the questions I have was, like, essentially with the whole, you know, turmoil of the whole Brexit crap and, you know, that whole struggle of wherever they're going on with that, uh, like, what, what do you really see if the real Republicans play in the, what role do you think you guys play in the post-Brexit Ireland? 
Okay, um, well, Brexit challenges everyone in, in different ways, <clears throat> but for Republicans and for us in the 32 County Sovereignty Movement, the challenge is to be politically prepared when the issue of national sovereignty will once again uh, be at the top of the political agenda. The border will be made manifest once again, and, and that will strip away uh, any uh, confusion, uh, and it will strip away the so-called all-Ireland architecture of the Good Friday Agreement. Right. Uh, Stormont will once again be seen to be nothing more than a British regional administration within a uh, part of the United Kingdom. Right. And I think it's very important to, to note that provisional Sinn Féin collapsed the institutions in recent weeks and it's coming across as if it's some form of corruption from unionism and based on a heating scheme scandal. Mm. Nothing could be further from the truth. The, with the Good Friday Agreement dead, the Sinn Féin strategy will be exposed as important uh, on Irish unity. Therefore, the objective in all of this was to have the institutions collapsed prior to the British government triggering, triggering Article 50 to commence the process of exiting the European Union. Now, that leaves Ireland in a position where now it has two imperial borders, one British and one European. Yeah, exactly. And, Coming and, uh, on both fronts. This has, has exposed the, the, the flaws, which we said at the time in 97 and in 1998, we said that this internal relationship and this internal agreement could not work. Uh, and that has, has proven time and time again with the various collapses of, of the Stormont administration in the intervening years. Hmm. So what we now have is is it collapsed again, and we have elections next week uh, to to and, and Sinn Féin are saying, well, that doesn't mean they're going back into Stormont. Hmm. Uh, there has to be this this and this uh, type of conditions, but the reality is Sinn Féin are being exposed uh, in all of this uh, as being important on the question of Irish unity and on the question of upholding the sovereignty of the Irish people. Well, exactly. But I think and it's also important to, to look a bit wider in the, in, in the United Kingdom's sense because the Brexit issue also has a huge bearing on the issue of Scottish independence. Yeah, exactly. And the breakup of the United Kingdom. So uh, Scotland d decides to, to vote to leave the UK um, the position of the occupied six counties within the UK will have no value in our terms for Westminster. And that could well initiate some form of long term process of disengagement, but we can't we can't take the British for granted on this <laughs> because they are masters at at controlling issues like this. And oh, this exactly. is why They've done it for a so long, they're already in control. Republic, Republican base, a credible Republican strategy is put in place, and I've alluded to that to the previous question. It's important that this, that the Republican base has a proper strategy in place to address these potentially massive constitutional changes that may take place, and our position would be back once again at the top of the... Uh, political agenda and, and and like and how would you say like all that uh, all the current occupation problems like how, you know how, how would you say that it directly affects everyday Irish lives to the point of you know where, where it needs to be an organized unified voice of we're not we're not standing for this anymore we can't take this in our daily life yes yes the the, the impact of the, the, the current occupation uh, in everyday life is, is something that that uh, uh, well has been and, and has has followed similar patterns to 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 that of any occupied country, and in Ireland the border 
uh, between the occupied six counties and the 26 counties is always present. However, within the European Union, the border became less obvious because there was free trade, free travel and all of that. Brexit now will like, make that all the more apparent. And, and we may well go back to a situation what the media and the government are classifying as hard or soft borders, but that's not relevant whether it's hard or soft. It only makes it more apparent in, in, as people are passing through it. But what's going to happen, as I said earlier, there's going to be two borders, an imperial, two imperial borders, a British and a European one. Uh, and also on in the, in, in the nature of our everyday lives, the whole issue of the occupation is such that that injustice is an ongoing aspect of it. The so-called justice system is designed to convict Irish men and women on their special legislation. You know, there is no judges. There's a diplomat court. Uh, evidence, flimsiest of evidence to suggest uh, to suggest to make a conviction is there. The, you know the the, the the corruption and the decision making. And uh, like, would, would you try conviction and the jail sentences? And but like, all of this is inextricably linked to the overall justice system, which includes policing and the policing service. So uh, policing then becomes political. Yeah, and like, would you see it as basically like a witch hunt for you know anyone who were who were to raise their voice against it, like specifically targeting them? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. For for any grouping or individuals involved in groups who, who stand against the establishment uh, and in in upholding the sovereignty of the Irish nation, they are targeted on a daily basis uh, in so called. Uh, stop and search legislation, and that's a that's a routinely done daily on a daily basis. Pardon me, on a daily basis. And uh, if one fails to comply with with all of the, the the requests that are made under the stop and search, they then are charged with uh, some spurious uh, allegation of of. of uh, Failing to cooperate with police or or uh, uh, disorderly behaviour, there's all sorts of, of spurious claims made. Then, and the person is brought along to court. The evidence is given by this corrupt police officers, uh, and the outcome then is in the corrupt judicial system. So we don't expect much justice uh, when the the. Uh, the, the greatest injustice of all is the occupation, and, and the system is designed to protect British interests. It's uh, it's designed to protect the occupation. Uh, therefore, our interests are, are, are secondary, and we're effectively second-class citizens in our own in our own country, uh, because the the judicial system does whatever is necessary to ensure that that uh, the uh, the establishment is protected and prime examples of this has come up over the years throughout the last 30 40 years no more so than, than, than the murder of solicitor pat van Ucken, whose family continue to 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 work within the system to try to get justice and, and to try to establish the truth in in the the murder of pat van Ucken. And it's, it's widely believed that this talented uh, solicitor and lawyer uh, in defending Irish citizens, he was the target by the British government and he was subsequently murdered. Uh, and at most, there's no murder today. Nevertheless, the system continues uh, to protect the British interests. And we have more recently the situation of of the British Secretary of State revoking the license of Tony Taylor in in Derry, and and he was uh, incarcerated uh, in jail again uh, on on the say so of a British of a British uh, politician. He doesn't get one vote in this country. 
this is the type of thing that, that, that we're up against on a continual basis where the judicial system is being propped up by British policing system uh, under the, the terms of, of uh, the, the Good Friday Agreement. And effectively, the RUC haven't went away. It's just been a name change to PSNI, but it doesn't matter what they're called because... Um, in, in an occupation like ours, uh, they're there to serve the interest of, of, of the British government. So my next question, since you brought up Tony Taylor, is what is internment and what role does it play in silencing a real dialogue on the current political situation in Ireland? Yes, well, internment's been around for, for as long as the occupation itself, and... Uh, it has taken many forms. It used to be you were lifted and interrogated, tortured, and held for whatever length of time without any process. And, and uh, various courts at an international level, European uh, particularly, then made decisions that um, exposed this this whole issue of internment that it was wrong, uh, that torture was wrong, and all of that. So what has replaced it? Is, is something more still, but it's still the same thing, and that's uh, the, uh, a person being held on remand. And uh, that's where a person is arrested on some spurious charge or other. And uh, there may not be any specific evidence uh, against it. It could be as simple as the word of a police, senior police officer saying this person's a membership of an illegal organisation. Nevertheless, that person is removed from their family, from their community, and put in jail. And, and out of that came the term internment by remand. <clears throat> and, and that has, a uh, person can read on remand in, uh, in custody. And the length of that could, if for that judicial process to take place, could be two and a half, three years. So this individual was, was uh, just a charge against him, uh, remains in jail for two and a half to three years. And uh, not found guilty of anything. And, and uh, at the end of that process, some people have been released. Uh, uh, there was no evidence to, to stand over the serious nature of the charge against them. In other cases, the corrupt judicial system uh, then would uh, give them a sentence and uh, whatever and, and all of that. But the point of internment is that it's designed to intimidate the population, and, and intimidate people from, from standing up against the establishment. To intimidate the people from from challenging establishment, to intimidate people for for upholding the sovereignty and their sovereign rights. And, and that's the scary thing. Like, especially to hear you talk about that, it, it just reminds me of you know like scenes in movies where you know the black bag goes over your head and you know you're gone for two years out of your life for 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 simply having beliefs or you know standing up for you know your sovereignty. And, you know from where you're from. Oh, absolutely. And it's designed totally to, to, to intimidate so that people don't uh, stand up to challenge any of the injustice that's going on. And, uh, you know, it's designed to take people away from the Republican project. And it's in place to, to, to attempt to not allies British rule in, in our society. And as you say, silence the opposition to it, you know. Uh, okay. Uh, it's one, but... Wondering, uh, my name is Don. Um, I'm also with Julian here. Um, what is uh, political policing and what role does it play in Irish politics? Uh, just one okay. second. So it seems that the phone cut out. We're going to go to a song, and it's fitting. We're going to play the Ballad of Alan Ryan. And we'll see if we can get Francie back on. If not, that's fine. The reason we're playing the Ballad of Alan Ryan is it's a one-year anniversary of the assassination of Vinnie Ryan, who was the brother of Alan Ryan, 
who was uh, murdered in front of his wife and kids. And it was quite sad that this happened last year. So we're playing this song as a tribute to Vinny, who was uh, basically it was like a proxy execution. It was an execution done by drug dealers under the watchful eye of the free state. So, uh, yeah, this is almost the one-year anniversary of his death, and we will be doing something. Oh, there's a phone. That must be uh, Mr. Francis Mackey back on the line. We'll play the Ballad of Alan Ryan after we finish this. So what is uh, the current, what is political policing in Ireland? Yes, the, the, the whole issue of political policing uh, in Ireland is... is uh, is linked very uh, closely to the uh, to the um, the whole judicial system, and uh, you know uh, we have a situation uh, whereby the um, the police operate under under uh, under special legislation whereby they can uh, they can. Uh, use special powers to stop and to search and uh, uh, as I said previously a system to, uh, to protect British interests uh, and I referred to um, the the, uh, the whole judicial system uh, to do whatever it is to, to protect uh, the uh, to protect the, the establishment and uh, I, I referred to the Craig Avon too in the Tony Taylor situation uh, in relation to, to all of that. The, um, but uh, I think that the whole issue of policing, the special powers that give to policing, whereby they stop and search on a daily basis, uh, intimidate. Uh, anyone who, who uh, stands up uh, to uphold their sovereignty, who stands against the establishment on any issue. The, uh, the whole issue of policing is political, and that those people will be targeted on a daily basis in, in relation to, to uh, as they go about their daily lives. Uh, we have situations where mothers on their way to school, their children being searched, uh, babies in, in prams being searched, uh, all designed to silence any opposition to to uh, to um, anyone who, who challenges the system. So in that context, all policing in an occupied country like ours is designed uh, to be political uh, and is political in the protection of the establishment. <clears throat> and uh, like, w and with the you know, with the population going to the prisons, going to the jails, you know, pretty much for all BS reasons, and you know, obviously political prisoners. Uh, well, like, what kind of stuff is going on around organization? <clears throat> sorry, around organization of prisoner support, prisoner and, aid, and what's happening right now in Mugabri specifically in terms of the issues between the, the screws and the prisoners? Yeah. Well, I, I don't have an updated figures in relation to uh, the numbers. And, uh, but as you said, in Megabri there are uh, certainly political prisoners of war in Megabri jail. And um, some are interned uh, on remand. Uh, some are awaiting sentencing. Some are sentenced sentenced with unsafe practice and unsafe evidence uh, on their, uh, which is designed to hold people uh, in the jail. Uh, and, uh, the Craig Avon 2 situation where Brent McConville and John Paul Wooden are, are sentenced prisoners, nevertheless all of the evidence is pointing that this was an unsafe sentencing and, and I'm talking about legal people who are coming out and saying this was an unsafe sentencing, but the evidence is not there to, uh, or has not been there to, to convict John Paul Wooden and Brenton 
the Commonwealth. However, the the um, corruption of, of the judicial system and, and the nature of non uh, non jury courts, leaving the outcome to to uh, to judges, uh, leaves us in a position that that uh, these unsafe sentencing and practices and outcomes will continue. Situation of Tony Taylor, something similar. He he, he languishes in jail, removed from his family, uh, and and uh, uh, he uh, on the word of a British Secretary of State. So uh, that is the examples of, of of it. The situation in the jail itself then is one of of continuous tension because uh, uh, being political prisoners. Uh, the, uh, the the prisoners themselves have fought very hard for for special status uh, that they're not criminals uh, and that they're in jail because of of uh, corruption. They're in jail because of a corrupt system that has put them in jail, and they're in jail because their country has been occupied by a foreign government. So uh, all in all, these prisoners then become the brunt of uh, a prison uh, administration who uh, are hostile to their politics uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, prison system then has, has uh, a regime of, of, of constraint uh, whereby uh, normal association with each other is, is prohibited uh, except at given times freedom of movement and of course uh, strip searching is, is something that's ongoing so all of these things are clearly violations of the individual's human rights but nevertheless they're allowed to continue within this prison system here in occupied Ireland and, and uh, many welfare a number of uh, welfare groups from from uh, various bodies have been involved in, in highlighting all of this and uh, taking it uh, to wherever they can with, with very little success. And going back a number of years, there was an agreement that was accepted by the prisoners in the relation to the, the regime that, of their daily, everyday living uh, arrangements. And of course, the prison administration. Uh, reneged on that agreement and reverted back to to the old system of, of, of uh, torture and violation of the individual's rights. Hmm. Okay, um, my name's Donald here, Francis. Um, I'm just wondering what what do you see happening to make forward to make the move forward the struggle right now? Yeah, I think that the future of Irish republicanism uh, and moving it forward, and, uh, and I've alluded to it uh, earlier when I was covering the question on on the current republican politics and where the 32 county sovereignty movement is. We're firm believers in working in unity of purpose uh, with other republican groupings and uh, there is a factionalised uh, Republican base in Ireland, and uh, I suppose there's some reasons, some various reasons for all of that. That there's different types of models of organisations, whether it's political party model or revolutionary model or, or whatever. What we're seeing is, and, and I think this is starting to be accepted across the board, that the violation of Irish national sovereignty which we set uh, out to uphold in 1997, uh, that now appears to be to be accepted across the political spectrum here uh, of, of republicanism. That uh, that sovereignty is the issue. That the violation of sovereignty by foreign government is the issue. And I suppose it's the extension then interpretation of the word sovereignty in, in relation to everyday living and making it relevant to, to, to contemporary Ireland to, to, to develop uh, the strategies around that. And I believe that 
the whole uh, issue of working closer with other Republican groups and individuals uh, to put in place that uh, political strategy uh, to put in place uh, all of that, the, uh, that you would uh, have a, a situation whereby uh, there's a consensus that we would have unity of purpose. And I refer specifically to, to, to last year, the centenary year of 1916 rising, the uh, two years prior to that, uh, Republicans, including the 32 County Sovereignty Movement, got together and we uh, uh, built, uh, uh, based on consensus, uh, uh, an organisation or an organised approach to how we were going to commemorate the the uh, centenary. And, uh, we had one of the largest marches through Dublin uh, on Easter Monday uh, last year. To, to uh, add on to Arbor Hill, the, the burial place of the uh, 1916 leaders. And the success of that, obviously, has, uh, has uh, bred a lot of interest and, and brought a lot of interest across the various groups on, on uh, maintaining the momentum of that working together. And uh, as I said earlier, we're now involved in the whole aspect aspect of putting in place a political strategy uh, with as broad a consensus as possible uh, and uh, working carefully and patiently with other groups. Uh, and we believe that there has been steady progress this year so far and uh, that that will be developed uh, into to, to a situation where uh, hopefully sooner rather than later that that the nature of that will that strategy would be disclosed but at this point in time it's 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 uh, in uh, it's it's in in, in progress a uh, work in progress all right um another question um we're not over there so what can we do to help over here with that struggle yeah no i think the, the uh, what I see that the, there is a, uh, a support base developing at an international level uh, and it's all down to, to some good work being done in, in, in areas like uh, yours. Uh, and I would ask that, that you would uh, continue with that good work in not alone uh, giving us the, the airtime and and support, but that we, uh, you know, that you, we ask that you lobby other groupings and governments to to uh, uphold the Irish people's rights, the Irish people's rights to their sovereignty, and that you would support our challenge uh, against the British government's violation of our rights and uh, the violation of our sovereignty and that you would support our challenge at the United uh, Nations, that you would lobby uh, governments and groupings uh, based on our position in uh, garnering that uh, support uh, for a struggle like ours here in Ireland. And we believe it's important that you continue to highlight the injustices of British rule in Ireland. Uh, and I suppose on that note, I would like to say thank you very much for that support. And, Thank you for having me on your program uh, to get our message out across the world and to ask you to keep uh, to continue to keep yourselves informed of our plight and to stand against all forms of imperialism. Well, like I said earlier, Brexit uh, in the UK will impose two imperial borders uh, uh, in Ireland, one British and, and one European. So it's important that our position uh, and that of the the Republican base and, and the Irish people is that our views are heard. It's, a, it's an alternative view to the establishment view, and we believe that the validity of our position based on sovereignty is one that that is most important to all of the Republican groupings and to the Irish people generally. The Irish people generally are panicked about what's going to happen following Brexit. But the, uh, the reality is that irrespective of one that's pro-European or anti-European,
European. The the island of Ireland is best served either all in or all out. It just cannot have this 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 British imposed border, uh, which takes the the the, uh, the occupied area out of Europe. The twenty six in Europe, and then that leaves us all on. Oh. second-class Irish citizens. Okay, so uh, just uh, to wrap things up, I'll give you a second to give your final thought. But a friend of ours uh, who's sitting here attended a Palestinian uh, meeting yesterday, and he just wants to pass on uh, just the message of solidarity from you, if you can. So I'll be quick. So he'll say that, and then full final thoughts. Um, my name is okay, Freddy yeah, Barsoom. Well, uh, Appreciate the, the the expression of solidarity from from a Palestinian representative, and, and we have, as we have in the past, continue to extend our solidarity to the plight of the Palestinian people. Uh, and we would hope that 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 could be brought to an early re- resolution. Uh, sadly, it hasn't been, and like our own conflict, it has resulted in. In, in death, it has resulted in murder, it has resulted in, in the Palestinian people being treated disgracefully. So, uh, like our own struggle, uh, my final thoughts are that, that, that uh, we continue to pursue uh, our agenda, that we continue to pursue our work based on upholding Irish national sovereignty and yeah. making the... Uh, and uh, making that position uh, relevant to the everyday lives of our people in Ireland. And uh, we are going through great austerity with more to come uh, in the occupied area. Uh, also in the 26 counties, the mishandling of the wealth and resources in Dublin is such that there is a disgrace of a situation has developed with the level of poverty, homelessness, and all of that. In, in in Dublin and mainly evident in areas like Dublin and centres of population but we know that it's right across the country and uh, that more and more people are becoming marginalised and removed because of this capitalist system of governance that exists so once again thank you Julian and thank your people in Canada for the support that you've shown to us over the past years and we hope to have and develop a stronger working relationship as we move forward.